Hi everyone, I'm Flag on HG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Soul Silver using only Smeargles. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. So this challenge is all about the Pokemon Smeargle. Smeargle is one of the dozen single stage Pokemon introduced in Generation 2. However, unlike many of the other completely forgettable Johto Pokémon, Smeargle has a pretty interesting gimmick. The only move that Smeargle can learn is the move Sketch. Sketch is a move that lets Smeargle permanently learn the move that the target last used. So, for example, if the enemy Pokémon uses Quick Attack on the previous turn, Smeargle can use Sketch on that Pokémon. And from then on, even after that battle is over, Smeargle can use the move Quick Attack. So effectively, Smeargle can learn almost any move in the entire game so long as you can successfully sketch the move from another Pokémon. Now you might be thinking, holy crap, all the moves in the game? Smeargle is an incredible Pokémon. But to offset the immense power of an unlimited moveset, Game Freak gave Smeargle the stats of an expired soggy loaf of bread. Just look at these stats. I mean, the speed is fine, but every other stat ranges from embarrassingly bad to tragically bad. 20 attack and 20 special attack is stupidly weak. A while back, I made a whole video about how Onix had an atrocious attack stat that was less than the attack stat of wimpy Pokémon like Oddish, Cutifly, and Yamper. It's actually really pathetic, but Smeargle's stats aren't your everyday, ordinary pathetic. These are... advanced pathetic. Guys, Smeargle has less than half the attack of Onix. It has half the attack of Pichu. There are exactly six Pokémon that have less physical attack than Smeargle and 7 Pokémon with less special attack. If you combine the physical and special attack stats of all 898 Pokémon that exist right now, only 4 Pokémon have less total attack than Smeargle. Those Pokémon are two fish who literally exist just to suck, Happiny, a baby Pokémon, and Shuckle, who has such monstrous defense and special defense that it has to be balanced out with garbage attack potential. So even though Smeargle can learn virtually any overpowered move, it will still hit with the force of a cotton ball. But okay, I mean not all Pokémon are designed to be strong damage dealers. Plenty of incredible Pokémon have relatively weak attack stats. But those Pokémon tend to be able to tank hits well, and Smeargle cannot. A small gust of wind knocks over Smeargle. So for this challenge, we're left with a Pokémon that takes a lot of damage from even light hits, and retaliates with very little damage in return. Smeargle does have a few other advantages at its disposal, though. For one, Smeargle's abilities are actually very good. It can have either own tempo, which prevents confusion, which is huge in earlier generations since 90% of the AI battles involve some form of confusion. Or it can have Technician, which gives moves with 60 base power or less a 1.5 times boost in power. I'll explain why this is a run saver later, but for now it's just nice to know that many of our attacks will hit with the force of a slightly stronger Cotton Ball. Another advantage is that Smeargle's normal typing means that it only has one weakness. Granted, that's the fighting type, which is the type of one of the gym leaders in Johto, and one of the Elite Four members, but I guess it could be worse. And of course, the final advantage is that Smeargle is known as the Painter Pokémon, which gives me an incredibly easy segue into the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find thousands of classes designed to teach you creative skills, ranging from topics like illustration, graphic design, video editing, and painting. Did you know that you can take a painting class taught by none other than famous painter Leonardo da Vinci? Okay, that's, that's not actually true, he's dead. But you can learn from really talented artists like Katie Rogers, who teaches the basics of watercolor in under an hour, or Angela McKay, who teaches a class on painting with, uh, that word. In no time, you'll be painting with the skill of an incredibly mediocre Pokémon. But of course, Skillshare classes aren't just for painting. For example, I will continue to sing the praises of Jordi Vanderputt's Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners class, which immensely helped me with learning how to edit my own videos. The best part about Skillshare classes is that they are optimized to put your learning first. There's no commitment or timeline to finish the class, you can skip individual lessons if you're not interested, and all classes are completely ad-free. If you want to give Skillshare a try, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare's premium membership so that you can explore your creativity for free. Thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the challenge. Just as a quick reminder, before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounter- Wait, actually, that's not true. I guess we can just skip the Species Claws this time. But actually, how is this challenge gonna work? 
It's pretty obvious that this challenge is impossible to do with a single Smeargle if we're using level caps. But Smeargle can only be caught in one area of Johto, and I don't get access to that area until after the fourth gym leader. So what I decided to do is call up my formerly incarcerated Uncle Jim Tendo, who hooked me up with a sweet, sweet special edition of Pokemon Soul Silver. Why Soul Silver instead of Heart Gold? I don't know, because last time I played Heart Gold. And it's not like it can make that much of a difference, right? Anyways, using this special edition of Pokemon Soul Silver, I was able to turn Pokemon I catch into Smeargles, like magic. So the encounter rule for this challenge was that for every route where I could normally catch a Pokemon from a patch of grass, I was allowed to catch the first Pokemon I encountered and magically turn it into a Smeargle. Routes, towns, and caves with encounters that did not have grass patches could not be used, just to limit the total number of Smeargles accessible in this challenge. The one exception to this was the starter from Newbark Town, which I also transformed into a Smeargle. Including the routes on Kanto before the Elite Four, that resulted in 22 additional potential Smeargle encounters. Which is good, because if Smeargles are good at anything, it's dying. And so, after converting my starter into a Smeargle named Picasso, our journey begins. Then it's time to get Picasso a move. See, even though Smeargle can theoretically learn any move in the game, in order to sketch a specific move, I need to actually be able to find a Pokémon that learns that move. So my options are actually pretty limited, especially early in the game. I decide that my best bet is to sketch Quick Attack from a Rattata. It's not the best move, but it'll do for now. After that, we face down our rival, who we mow down with stab quick attacks. We also kind of have a level advantage. But just look at how little damage we do to a Cyndaquil with a 4 level advantage. It's not great. Anyways, we name our rival Fascism, and then I'm given Pokeballs, so I can now catch some encounters. But of course, in blind haste, I immediately run from the first encounter of Route 29. This is still a Nuzlocke, so if I don't succeed in catching the first encounter, tough luck but I get another chance at an encounter on Route 30, which I do successfully catch. So I name the new Smeargle Kahlo. She has Technician, so she'll hit a little bit harder than Picasso at least. On Route 31, I get another Smeargle and I name her O'Keefe. And then on Route 32, I catch a fourth Smeargle. At this point, I realize that I know very few famous female painters, so it's time to educate myself a little bit and learn about a few more painters that the American school system decided to just toss aside. Welcome to the team, Cassatt. From here, I need to sketch some moves onto these guys, though our choices are still pretty limited. Smeargle learns Sketch again at level 11, so each of our Smeargles can learn two moves apiece before the first gym. I give most of them Quick Attack from Rattata, although when I try to sketch Quick Attack on O'Keefe, the Rattata outspeeds me and uses Tackle, so I end up sketching Tackle instead. That's effectively a waste of a move slot until O'Keefe levels up to level 41 and I can replace Tackle with another iteration of Sketch. And since this is Heart Gold and Soul Silver, level 41 is not until after the 7th gym badge. Cool. Anyways, I also give a bunch of my Smeargle Synthesis from Wild Hoppip, so now we have recovery. Time to face the first gym leader, Faulkner. So let's see if Team Smeargle can handle the flying types of the Johto region. First up is Pidgey, so I lead O'Keefe, the powerhouse of the team. She hits Pidgey with a quick attack that actually does a sizable chunk of damage. And then we tank a tackle with our massive defense tat. Then we finish off the Pidgey with another quick attack. So Faulkner brings out the true king of the Johto skies, Pidgeotto. An illegal Pidgeotto, I might add. Have you no shame, Faulkner, using hacked Pokemon? It's a disgrace. Anyways, I switch to Cassatt, who gets hit by a hard tackle. Cassatt doesn't actually know any attacking moves. She just gets off a few tail whips and stays healthy with synthesis. So she's able to get off four tail whips as Pidgeotto just goes for relatively weak tackles and gusts. After that, I switch back to O'Keefe, who tanks a gust. Thanks to the four defense drops from Tail Whip, Quick Attack is now a two-hit kill, so two more Quick Attacks while tanking a tackle are enough to finish off the Pidgeotto, winning us our first Gym Badge. That first Gym Badge was pretty easy, but next up is Bugsy, who has a Scyther, which is incredibly strong for this point of the game, or for Smeargles in general. I also accidentally run from another encounter on Route 33, so I'm stuck with just four Smeargles. If only there was some other place that I could get a grass patch encounter. But unfortunately, there is definitely 100% not. I did keep Sketch on Kahlo though, so I can teach her one move to deal with Scyther. Given that Scyther is a bug flying type, I'd ideally like to get a rock type move. But remember, in order to teach Smeargle a rock type move, I need to find a Pokemon with a rock type move to Sketch. And based on my research, there is exactly one Pokemon that I can Sketch a rock type move from at this point in the game. Hiker Daniel in Union Cave has an Onyx at level 11 that knows Rock Throw. The Wild Onyx and Geodude in Union Cave are too low level to know a Rock-type move. So this Onyx is my only shot, which comes with a lot of problems. 
Since this is a trainer battle, I only get one shot. If I mess up or if one of my Smeargles gets close to dying, I can't just run away and try again. It also means that after sketching the rock throw, I have to actually beat the Onyx. With Smeargles. That only know Quick Attack. On top of that, this Onyx knows Screech to lower our defense and Bind, which prevents switching. So this is an absolute nightmare and incredibly dangerous. I basically have to switch between Smeargles to shake off Screeches, use Synthesis to stay healthy, and pray that Onyx doesn't murder any of my Smeargles if they get stuck in with Bind. Eventually, I'm able to get Kahlo into a position to sketch Rock Throw. Then it's just a very painful process of quick attacking the Onyx over and over and over again. This fight takes 18 whole minutes. But fortunately, it does all end up working out. I won't mention every single time I need to sketch a new move because I would make this video super long, and it's probably already going to be pretty long based on the script length, but just know that sketching moves is not always as easy as you might think it is. Anyways, now we have a 4 times super effective rock move to hit Scyther with, and thanks to Kahlo's Technician ability, the normally 50 base power rock throw has 75 base power, so we'll be able to hit Scyther with an effective 300 base power move, as long as we hit it. Should be fun. Fortunately, on the first turn that Bugsy has Scyther out, it uses Focus Energy, so we get off a Rock Throw, which does connect and hits Scyther hard, though it obviously doesn't kill because of Smeargle. So on the next turn, Scyther hits a Quick Attack, which does crit, but it's fine, because Rock Throw connects again. Well, I, I gotta say, that's pretty bad, guys. That had to just be a really, really low roll. Bugsy heals, and Rock Throw manages to connect for a third time, but now we're in trouble. Kahlo is definitely dead to a U-turn or a critical hit quick attack here, but I do see my out. I switch to Cassat, who mercifully doesn't get crit by U-turn. Hopefully this battle shows that playing around the crit is gonna kinda not really be a thing that we do in this run, because we can't. Anyways, this causes Bugsy to bring out Metapod, which only knows Tackle. This lets me get a few Tail Whips off, and also lets me bring Cassat back to almost full health with Synthesis. Then I can switch back to Kahlo and use Synthesis with her until she's effectively at full HP as well. From here, I can kill the Metapod with Rock Throw, which is still not missing, surprisingly. Then, after we gain a level from knocking out the Metapod, Scyther comes back in, and it just wastes a turn using Focus Energy. So against all odds, we hit a fifth Rock Throw, knocking out Scyther. Last is Kakuna, who goes down to two more Rock Throws, which also don't miss. Kakuna does get a Poison off, because of course, but it's fine. That's badge number two. But out of the frying pan and into the fire we go, because next up is Whitney and her Miltank. And since the level cap is level 19, none of our four Smeargle can learn any new moves. Fortunately, I am able to catch a few more Smeargles before we have to take her on. First, I remember I can go back to Route 46 and catch a Smeargle who I named Ali. Then, after clearing through Ilex Forest, I get a Smeargle from Route 34 and name him Van Gogh. So now we have a full team of six Smeargles. From here, it's just getting ready to fight Whitney. With Dali, I can sketch Leech Seed from Picnic or Gina's Bulbasaur so that we can have it to gain HP back from Miltank. But then this bullshit happens. See, on Route 34, there is a 35% chance to encounter a Rattata. These Rattata can be level 11, 12, or 13. At level 13, Rattata can learn Pursuit, which does double damage when switching out. For one hot second, I was accidentally leading with Dali when walking through this grass patch. He needed to be under level 11 when learning Leech Seed so that he could learn Sketch again at level 11. So I hadn't had time to train him up yet. This Rattata will outspeed, so I don't want to try and run. Fortunately, a Pursuit from Rattata won't kill me on the switch, so long as it doesn't crit. But of course, it does. The odds of encountering a Rattata here, it being level 13, it choosing to use Pursuit, which is random since this is a wild Pokemon, and it getting a critical hit, is offensively small. Well, no more Leech Seed, and now we have our first death. Rest well, Salvador. Well, north of Goldenrod City, I can catch a few more Smeargles, so long as we avoid accidentally running into too many trainers, since my main Smeargles are getting pretty close to the level cap. From Route 35, I get a Smeargle named Angiosola. From National Park, I get a Smeargle named Da Vinci or Davinci, your choice. And from Route 36, I get a Smeargle named Wood. Now we got some options. Well, sort of. After picking the six least shitty Smeargles that we have, it's time to face Whitney. She leads Clefairy, and I lead Cassat. She's the resident Tail Whipper, so that's what we go for as we pray that Clefairy doesn't get some ungodly move from her metronome. We luck out as she just hits a soft Fire Fang. With two Tail Whips off, I switch to Da Vinci, who gets hit by two hits from a Double Slap. On the next turn, Da Vinci goes for a double kick, which we sketched off a wild Nidoran. This is a pretty good move since Technician gives it 90 base power. 
but even with the minus two defense, we somehow don't knock out the Clefairy. But at least she just misses a double slap. It's also not the end of the world that we miss out on this kill, since Whitney does waste a super potion here. But Clefairy's cute charm activates as we hit another double kick. That is actually pretty likely to happen here, since each individual hit of double kick has a 30% chance of activating it. So we switch to Cassat, who tanks a soft three hits from double slap. I use Synthesis to gain some health back, and then tank another three hits from double slap. Then I switch back to Da Vinci, who somehow manages to only get slapped twice again. Over three double slaps, this Clefairy has hit Da Vinci a grand total of four times. Anyways, now that he's not in love, he kicks Clefairy in the face and she goes down. Next up, the Mill Tank. The first thing to do is tank a non-critical hit stomp, avoid the flinch, and hit a string shot to lower Mill Tank's speed, since it is surprisingly fast. We do avoid the crit and the flinch, but then we miss our 95% accurate string shot. Why is String Shot 95% accurate? Why? Was String Shot too damn good to give it 100% accuracy, Game Freak? W what, were you afraid that Caterpie was going to be too overpowered if it had 100% accurate String Shots? What the hell? Smeargles are going down in this battle, that's for sure. Starting with Couldn't Hit Water Falling Out of a Boat Da Vinci. See ya, buddy. I bring in Angusola, who tanks a stomp, and then gets off a charm, harshly lowering Miltank's attack. Now we just gotta pray Miltank doesn't crit. On the next turn, we survive another stomp and hit another charm. The next stomp does flinch us, but that's fine. Just don't crit. The next stomp also flinches, so it looks like we won't be getting Miltank down to minus six. Bummer. I decide to let Angusola go down to get a free switch to another Smeargle. But for some reason, Miltank goes for a rollout, which leaves Angusola with one HP. So never mind, we do get it to minus six. Angusola is a survivor, unlike Da Vinci. But now that the mill tank is stuck in rollout, it's super safe to switch to Picasso here. Then we do big damage with quick attack, as we just hope that mill tank never crits. Rollout is starting to increase in power and do serious damage, but spamming synthesis means we're able to survive even the fifth and strongest rollout, as long as it doesn't crit, of course. After that, I switch to Cassat, who is immune to attract. And then we start clicking Tail Whip and staying healthy with synthesis. You know, the only thing Cassat does. At some point, I figure out that we're actually speed tied with the mill tank, which is sorta cool and means we're less likely to get stomp flinched. Cassad is able to somehow avoid like 10 potential critical hits and get mill tank down to minus 6 defense. After that, I switch to Picasso, who just starts chugging away with quick attacks, which is now like a 5 hit kill. Somehow there's still been no critical hit, but that's about to change. Once mill tank is in the red, Whitney heals, and then Picasso gets a critical hit. See folks, that's called subverting expectations. Hollywood take note. One more quick attack knocks out Miltank, winning us the third gym badge. That was incredibly lucky. I think even one poorly timed critical hit from Miltank, and that could have been a wipe. After that, the level cap finally goes over to level 21, so some of our Smeargles can now learn three moves. I'm also able to get quite a few more Smeargle encounters here. From Route 37, I get a Smeargle named Keen. From Route 38, I get a Smeargle named Savage, or Savage, or Savage, I don't know. And from Route 42, I get a Smeargle named Kusama. Now it's time to face Morty, but because we have six team members that are immune to his ghost type moves, and Morty's moveset has next to zero coverage, it's a pretty easy win. I sketched Bite onto Picasso, which doesn't even one-shot the Ghastly, but ultimately it is enough to take out all his Pokémon. I'm gonna actually skip this battle because it's pretty long. I end up having to PP stall the Haunter thanks to it having Hypnosis and Dream Eater, which is pretty tedious to edit, it ends up getting a little tricky at the end because of Sucker Punch from his last Haunter, but it all works out fine. If you want to see the full fight, there's a VOD of it on my VODs channel. Go check it out. The link is in the description. Anyways, let's just move on. After beating Morty, our level cap hits level 31, so we get access to a fourth and final move slot on at least a few of our Smeargles. So we have a few more move slots to figure out how to handle Chuck, the fighting type gym leader. Chuck has notoriously garbage AI, so he's a bit unpredictable in terms of what he might do, but his Pokemon are very strong, and in the case of his Primeape, very fast. So this is kind of a big problem for our normal types. At this point, I decide to go ahead and sketch arguably one of the best moves in the game, Spore. It's a 100% accurate sleep move. This will be an absolutely vital move for the rest of the playthrough. The only problem is that very few Pokemon can learn Spore naturally, making it very difficult to sketch. Fortunately, Paris can learn Spore at level 17, and we can find Paris in National Park during a bug catching contest, Unfortunately, Paris only has a 10% encounter rate, and they can be found at any level from 10 to 17. So it does take a very, very long time to find a Paris at exactly level 17, 
but once I do, with the help of a Chesto Berry, we can sketch Spore. On exactly one of our Smeargles, since I'm only allowed to bring one Pokémon with me for the bug catching contest. I will have to do this process of finding a Paris at level 17 during a bug catching contest several times throughout this playthrough. I also get two new Smeargles here. First, from Route 38, I catch a Smeargle and name him Bob Ross. Then, on Route 48, I catch a Smeargle and name him Monet. Okay, so now that we have Spore, we can easily put Pokémon to sleep, which will allow us to either potentially get off free damage, or get away with setting up. But of course, in order to set up, we need set up moves. Fortunately, we are able to sketch Swords Dance from Farfetch'd, which can be found at level 25 on Route 48. At least that's what it says on Cerebi. Right here. The tricky thing about this is that you can also find Diglets here, which can trap you in with Arena Trap, meaning that you can't run from them. Given that these Diglets have Magnitude, this is an amazing way to accidentally lose a Smeargle. So to avoid this, I can lead with a level 25 Smeargle and use Repels. This will prevent me from running into any Pokémon under the level of 25, since, as you can see here on Cerebi, Farfetch'd is the only Pokémon that can be level 25. Using this method, I will only ever run into Farfetch'd. Theoretically. But after doing this for about 5 minutes and never running into a Farfetch'd, or any Pokémon for that matter, I was starting to get suspicious, and it turns out that Cerebi is wrong about the level that you can find Farfetch'd at on Route 48. See, for some weird reason, Farfetch'd are found at level 25 in Heart Gold, but at level 24 in Soul Silver. I would love to know why, because I genuinely cannot think of a reason why this would be an intentional difference between versions of the game. Now, this tiny difference normally would not matter whatsoever, but in this challenge, it does because Farfetch'd learns Swords Dance at exactly level 25, meaning that in Soul Silver, I cannot sketch Swords Dance onto my Smeargles. Cerebi, please fix this incredibly minor error in your documentation. Please. Well, no Swords Dance, but I can still get Meditate from Wild Drowsy, but that's a pretty big bummer. Turns out, though, that the Spore and Setup wouldn't have worked against Chuck anyways, because he leads with a Primeape that has the ability Vital Spirit, so he actually can't be put to sleep. So instead, I need to come up with a different plan. I do, but the plan sucks. So I'm feeling very shaky as I head into this battle with Dadbot over here. Chuck leads with his Primeape, and we lead with Savage, who, with some speed EVs, is just barely able to outspeed Primeape with an Aerial Ace. With a Held Sharp Beak and some attack EVs, this will just barely be a two-hit kill with Aerial Ace. Or she'll get a critical hit and knock out Primeape in one shot. Absolutely savage. Polyrath comes out next and tries to go for a Focus Punch, but we spore it to sleep. The scary thing here is that if Polyrath wakes up at any point and connects with a Focus Punch, Savage will just die. Like, really, really hard. So I have no choice but to just attack. Aerial Ace does pretty embarrassing damage, and then Polyrath hits a Body Slam, which does a huge chunk. I put Polyrath back to sleep as it tries to use Focus Punch. Then I decide to risk a one-turn sleep and go for a Synthesis. Fortunately, Polyrath stays asleep so then I go for another Aerial Ace. Unfortunately, another Citrus Berry means we'll need to hit two more, but at least Polyrath stays asleep. So I go for another Aerial Ace as Polyrath wakes up and whiffs a Focus Punch. So I spore the Polyrath again, just in case Chuck heals. But he doesn't, so one more Aerial Ace. Leaves Polyrath with one HP. Great. Well, now Chuck heals, so I hit it with an Aerial Ace. Then Chuck stays asleep as I hit it with yet another Aerial Ace. And then, yeah, you guessed it, Aerial Ace leaves it with 1 HP. So it's another Hyper Potion as I hit another Spore. And then it's just 4 more Aerial Aces as Polyrath mercifully stays asleep. That was really dumb, but hey, most fights with Chuck end up that way anyways. So the 5th badge is ours. Up next is the part of the game where the 7th gym has a lower level cap than the 6th gym, so my plan is to take on Price first. Before that, I decide to go back to the Ruins of Alf and get a Smeargle named Rembrandt. I also go to Route 43 and catch a Smeargle named Peters. Before fighting Price, I have to help Lance kill a man and raid the Rocket Hideout. At one point, we actually fight alongside each other in a double battle, so I take this opportunity to sketch Fly from his Dragonite onto Picasso. It's not a great move, but it makes traveling around Johto easier without having to carry around a dedicated HM user. And the image of flying on a Smeargle is pretty funny. Anyways, now it's time for Price. He leads Seal, and I lead Rembrandt. The plan here is to encore the seal into using hail and then set up with growth for a special attack sweep. Unfortunately, the seal goes for icy wind to lower my speed, so I need to switch out to savage. And Price's seal is so slow that it actually needs to hit icy wind three times to outspeed savage. 
So Savage just sits there and does nothing for a few turns. Now that Seal is finally faster than Savage, I switch back to Rembrandt as Seal goes for Hail. I encore Seal into Hail, and then I proceed to set up six growths. You might think that six growths is overkill, but I promise you it, it's not. I do have to use Encore again at some point because Seal's Encore ends before I can set up all six growths, but there's really nothing Price can do at this point. Well, I mean, I guess he could technically switch, but he's not going to do that. So after setting up, we hit a Technician boosted Mega Drain and finish off the Seal, gaining a good chunk of health back in the process. Next is Pyloswine, so we hit it with a Technician boosted Water Pulse for the one shot. And then last is Dugon. But with plus 6 special attack, a Mega Drain is just strong enough to get the one shot, winning us our 6th gym badge. After that, it's time to backtrack to Jasmine's gym in Olivine City. We make sure to sketch a few useful moves to deal with her steel types. She leads with her first Magnemity, and I lead with Angiosola, who sketch Dig from a Wild Diglet. The Magnemity goes down in one shot. The second Magnemity comes out next, and the same fate awaits it. Nice job, Angiosola. But now the real task begins. Jasmine sends out her Steelix. With a wide lens equipped, Angusola connects with a Will-O-Wisp. Steelix does waste a turn with Sandstorm here, so that's nice. And then on the next turn, I go for a Charm, and then Steelix hits a Soft Iron Tail. Then I go for another Charm, and Steelix hits another Softer Iron Tail. Angusola is definitely at risk to a crit here, but I risk it anyways and just get off another Charm. Steelix doesn't crit, so after surviving on 1 HP against Whitney's Mill Tank, Angusola survives yet another gym battle. I switch to Rembrandt, who tanks an Iron Tail, which does get the defense drop, but Sandstorm ends. So on the next turn, a Water Pulse obviously just barely misses out on the kill, and then Steelix sets up another Sandstorm. Burn leaves Steelix with just 1 HP again. From here, Jasmine heals, but then I just Encore Steelix into Sandstorm. I don't feel like dealing with Jasmine using another Hyper Potion, so I Growth once. And then on the next turn, Water Pulse plus Burn damage knocks out Steelix, winning us our 7th Gym Badge. We haven't had a death for quite some time, but now that we're in the late game, pretty much every major battle is against strong Pokemon that are very capable of killing our Smeargles. I promised you that Smeargles will die, so get ready, because from here on out, it gets pretty brutal. First up, I have to stop Team Rocket in Radio Tower. Normally, I skip right over this because it's easy. You know, assuming you don't have six copies of one of the weakest Pokemon in the game. There's a bunch of Rocket Execs to take out here, and first up is Petrol, who has five coughings and a wheezing that all know Self-Destruct or Explosion. I lead Kusama, who has max special attack EVs and a choice specs. With Psybeam, she's able to knock out Petrol's coughing in one shot. But second is Wheezing, and even with a six level advantage, she can't one shot it, so it gets off a smoke screen. Now I've got an issue. If I miss a Psybeam against this Wheezing or any of the remaining coughings, there's a very strong chance they explode and kill Kusama, the only Smeargle I have that can one-shot these guys. As much as it pains me here, I need to switch out to reset the accuracy drop, so I bring out Savage. But sadly, Weezing explodes, savagely murdering Savage in the process. She will be missed, but her sacrifice will not be in vain, because Kusama is now able to come back out and kill Petrol's remaining four coughings in one shot apiece. Next up, we have a pretty tricky fight with Fascism, but it works out okay. Then a random grunt's coughing self-destructs on Picasso, which would have just killed if it crit, but thankfully it didn't. Then we have to fight Ariana, which really shouldn't have been a difficult fight, but I got stupid unlucky against her Arbok. I'm talking crunch defense drops, missing will-o'-wisps, one-turn sleeps, full paras after glare, more defense drops from crunch. It was an absolute nightmare. But we make it out with everyone alive, which leads us to Archer. He has a Houndoom in the back, which is strong enough to one-shot our Smeargles with a critical hit. So the plan is to set up against his much more manageable Houndor. The issue is that the Houndor can't be burned, so we're susceptible to critical hits. It also has early bird, so sleep is not very useful. And it has roar, so it can force us to switch out while we're setting up. So basically, it was kind of stupid to try and set up on this thing. Well, I start by successfully getting off three charms to bring the Houndor to minus six attack. Then I switch to Bob Ross and Spore it. Then I switch to Kusama, but Houndor wakes up early because of Early Bird and hits a faint attack. So I start growthing. I was able to sketch Surf off of a trainer with a Gyarados on Route 43, but I still need four growths to guarantee the kill on Houndoom in the back. Unfortunately, after setting up three, Houndor uses Roar, and Rembrandt comes out. I decide to Encore it using Roar, thinking I might be able to PP stall it out of Roar. But that doesn't make much sense, honestly, because it likely won't go for Roar unless I'm setting up. Kahlo ends up being out when Houndor's pointless Encore ends, so I switch back to Rembrandt. I'm getting very lucky that Firefang isn't burning here. 
I go for a growth, and then Houndor hits with a critical hit bite. But thanks to a citrus berry, I recover enough that a non-critical hit won't kill me. So I use Encore to lock it into bite. That way, it won't roar again. Then I switch to Kusama to start setting up growths during Houndor's Encore. But it gets another critical hit on the switch. So I have to waste a turn healing with Synthesis. So by the time Houndor's Encore ends, I've only set up one growth. Well, I heal with Synthesis, but now I'm almost out of Synthesis PP as well. I set up a second growth as I dodge yet another burn from Fire Fang. I go for a third growth, and then Houndor uses Roar, again bringing out Rembrandt. I go for Encore again, because at this point I'm just playing really poorly and kinda hoping to get lucky. Eventually Kusama gets dragged out, so I use my last Synthesis PP as Houndor uses Roar one more time to bring Angiosola out, and then the Encore ends. So I switch to Bob Ross, who gets hit with a Feint Attack. And then I use Spore. I start going for Meditate, hoping to get Houndor to use Roar again. If it does, and I get lucky and Rembrandt comes out, I might be able to Encore him into Roar again, and burn through his last Roar PP. Houndor does eventually use Roar, but Kusama comes out instead. I don't know, it was a long shot. Well, I decide to just start going for growths. After two growths, I decide that it's just best to kill the Houndor, and then pray that Houndoom can't kill us from this HP without a critical hit. So, Surf knocks out the Houndor. Second is Houndoom. And so, I go for a Surf, which high rolls and does great damage to Houndoom. Then Houndoom goes for a Fire Fang. And we survive! But then it gets the burn, knocking out Kusama. I bring out Rembrandt and kill Houndoom with a Water Pulse. Honestly, if Archer healed there, this would have definitely been game over. Last is Coughing. Since it's Archer's last Pokemon, it shouldn't self-destruct, but this still isn't great. I bring in Bob Ross, who gets hit by a Sludge. A Citrus Berry means we can survive another one, so I spore the Coughing to sleep. And then I switch to Kahlo. Then I use Meditate as Coughing continues to sleep. And then I hit an Aerial Ace for very little damage. Coughing wakes up and uses Haze, so our Meditate boost was a waste of time. So I just go for another Aerial Ace. We get lucky with a critical hit, but then Coughing retaliates with the Sludge, which poisons. So now we are dead to even a non-critical hit. So I switch to Picasso, who gets hit with the Sludge, which poisons. So now we are dead to even a non-critical hit. I can't really afford to switch here though, so I just do some damage. Theoretically, Picasso could flinch with Bite to save himself, but of course that doesn't happen. So Picasso goes down to poison. Then I bring in Bob Ross, who is basically our only hope here. I go for a Spore, and then I pray that Aerial Ace can kill this thing before it wakes up. The coughing of course wakes up after one turn, but I finally catch a break and it goes for Smokescreen. So, one more Aerial Ace is enough to knock out the coughing, finally ending an absolutely brutal battle. Honestly, this was a sloppy, sloppy battle, and I kinda deserved to be punished for it. My plays were terrible, and I was not prepared for it. I should have had a backup plan, but because I didn't, our death toll is now at 5 Smeargles. Go ahead and make a guess as to how many you think there will be when it's all said and done. Well, now that Team Rocket is defeated, it's time to head to Blackthorn City to face Claire for the 8th Gym Badge. On the way, we get chances at two more Smeargles to replace the dogs that we just lost. First is Pollock from Route 44. But on Route 45, the first encounter is a Graveler. If we catch it, the Graveler will be magically turned into a Smeargle thanks to Uncle Jim's special version of the game. But the Graveler might also explode if I don't catch it right away. I don't want to risk that, so I just run. No encounter from Route 45. Fortunately, we have a few Smeargles waiting in the box still. And now that we're in Blackthorn City, we also have access to the Move Relearner, effectively giving our Smeargles unlimited sketches. This is great because it means that I can tailor the movesets of all of our Smeargles to each specific fight. You do need a great deal of hard scales to do this, but as with many of the challenges that I do on stream, I use Uncle Jim Tendo's special version of the game to give me unlimited hard scales, so that I don't have to sit there and rock smash rocks in Cyan Wood City for hours in a row. Also, now might be a good time to say that I am using rare candies to level up my Smeargles, mainly to cut out grinding from the streams. Whether or not I use rare candies depends on the playthrough, but for this one, I figured that I would just use it to speed the whole thing up, since I have to spend so much extra time sketching moves onto every Smeargle anyways. Well, after training a few of these Smeargles up, coming up with a sort of sketchy plan, and absolutely crushing this children's puzzle, it's time to take on Claire. She leads with Gyarados, and I lead with Cassat. She starts with a Protect to stall some PP as Gyarados uses Dragon Pulse. Then she goes for a Growl as Gyarados uses Bite. Then she uses Spite to drain Gyarados of Bite PP. Gyarados retaliates with a Dragon Pulse, which activates a Citrus Berry. Then Cassat goes for another Growl as Gyarados hits another hard Dragon Pulse. Cassat uses Protect on another Dragon Pulse. And then it's time for her to go down to give us a free switch. 
She growls into Gyarados, but then it goes for Bite, leaving one of our Smeargles with 1 HP for the second time this challenge. Well, we just spite on the next turn, and Kassat goes down to a Twister. Thank you for your service. Angusola comes out next, and I go for a Will-O-Wisp, which misses, and Gyarados retaliates with a Dragon Rage. So on the next turn, I hit a Will-O-Wisp, and Gyarados hits another Dragon Rage. Then I switch to Rembrandt, who gets hit by another Dragon Rage. I go for a Recover, as Gyarados uses Dragon Pulse. Then I go for another Recover, as Gyarados continues with Dragon Pulse. We repeat this process until Gyarados falls into the red. Then on the next turn, Claire heals Gyarados with a Hyper Potion. And then I use Sketch, so that Rembrandt actually now knows Dragon Pulse which we'll need to take care of the Kingdra waiting in the back. This kinda sucks though, because I thought that Claire would be using a full restore instead of a hyper potion, so now I can't put Gyarados to sleep with Spore. So I have to switch to Kahlo to stall out Gyarados' last Dragon Pulse PP. Then, as it goes for Twister, I use Recover to get Kahlo back to full HP. Then I switch back to Rembrandt. Unfortunately, Gyarados still has Dragon Rage PP, so it's doing pretty good damage. And thanks to Burn draining its HP, we don't have many turns to set up. So unfortunately, because of turns spent healing with Recover, I only get two growths off before Gyarados succumbs to burn damage. That is definitely not enough to kill Kingdra in the back, even with Dragon Pulse. So now we gotta bank on getting lucky with sleep turns. Kingdra comes out, and we outspeed to put it to sleep. On the next turn, we hit a Dragon Pulse, which does a good chunk of damage, and thankfully Kingdra stays asleep. So one more Dragon Pulse just barely knocks out Kingdra. Third is Claire's first Dragonair. Dragon Pulse isn't a guaranteed kill here either, so we gotta get lucky again. First step is to put the Dragonair to sleep, and then we pray that Dragon Pulse gets the high roll, or that Dragonair stays asleep. Thankfully we get the former, and Dragonair goes down. Claire's second Dragonair is last, so we do the same thing. Spore in case we don't get the one shot, and then a Dragon Pulse, which does knock out Dragonair, winning us the eighth and final gym badge. That was yet another very sloppy battle. Against both Archer and Claire, I made some very dumb mistakes. I also should have sketched Smokescreen onto at least one of my Smeargles to put the odds in my favor a bit more when I was setting up on Houndor and Gyarados. Live and learn. Except for Cassat. She died and didn't learn. Well, with all eight badges collected, we just need to wrap up a few things before taking on the Pokemon League. The first is fighting against the Kimono Girls that I've been helping throughout the game. They each have an evolution, but the catch is that you have to fight them without a break between the battles. Since all the evolutions are significantly better than my Smeargles, this is kinda tough. The first one leads with an Umbreon, so I lead with Van Gogh. I put Umbreon to sleep with Spore, then I switch to Bob Ross as Umbreon sleeps. Then I go for a Meditate as Umbreon sleeps again. So it's another Meditate as Umbreon wakes up and hits a hard Dark Pulse. So I put it to sleep on the next turn. Then I recover, and Umbreon continues to sleep. Then I start going for Double Kick. Umbreon manages to wake up, and hits another Dark Pulse. Another Double Kick will kill here, but since I don't heal between battles, I make sure to spore it and recover back to full HP before finishing it off. Next is the Kimono Girl with Espeon. You may have noticed that Van Gogh is pre-damaged to 1 HP. That's because he knows Flail, which is able to one-shot the Espeon. Even with a Silk Scarf and the 7 level advantage, it wasn't quite enough to kill Umbreon though, because it's so bulky. Next up is Flareon, who unfortunately has Quick Attack, so we can't use the Flail strat. I switch to Monet, who has a very fun, but honestly ultimately not very useful trick up his sleeve, but I wanted to do it anyways. First I put Flareon to sleep. Then I use Transform, which I sketched off of a wild ditto. Now I've got access to Flareon's moveset. I still keep my own HP, which is maxed out with EVs. I use Quick Attack, Will-O-Wisp, and Fire Blast, despite the latter two being ineffective, so that on the next turn I can use Last Resort, which can only be used after using all your other moves at least once. It finishes off Flareon in one shot. Next up is Seo and Jolteon, but thanks to the speed EVs and the level advantage, we can outspeed and knock out Jolteon with a single flail. So last is Vaporeon, who also knows Quick Attack. So I switch to Monet. Then I go for a Spore. And then I recover as it snoozes. Then I transform. Vaporeon wakes up and goes for a Surf, but it's ineffective thanks to Water Absorb. Then she starts attacking as I go for moves that let me use Last Resort. Unfortunately, Vaporeon gets the same idea and is able to hit a very nasty Last Resort. It was bad timing that he woke up the turn I transformed and hit the Surf. Had I transformed before Vaporeon woke up, he would have never used Surf. Well, I decide to risk a crit and get hit by another Last Resort, and then I retaliate with my own Last Resort. I'm dead to another last resort though, and I don't think we kill with another one even if we win the speed tie. So I switch to Rembrandt, who gets hit hard by a last resort. I spore the Vaporeon to put it to sleep. Then I use Recover as Vaporeon sleeps. 
Then I use Dragon Pulse for a little bit of damage. And then Vaporeon wakes up and hits a nasty Surf, killing Rembrandt. Rest well, Rembrandt. Thank you for being so clutch against Claire. You will be Rembrandted. From here, Bob Ross comes out to spore Vaporeon, and then she mercifully stays asleep as Bob Ross finishes her off with two turns of double kick. Well, now we're up to seven deaths. From here, I gotta go fight Luigi, but I'm not in the mood to deal with it, so I just throw my Master Ball at it and call it a day. Whatever. After that, I make sure to teach Waterfall to my Gyarados HM Mule, which gives me access to a Grass Patch on Route 47. So welcome to the team, Goya. This Grass Patch also has Farfetch'd at level 35, so we are now finally able to sketch Swords Dance. Anyways, after that, it's time to head to Kanto and the Pokemon League. Along the way, I catch the last two Smeargles of the run, Alf Klint from Route 27, and Ivazovsky from Route 26. Now in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Victory Road doesn't have any trainers in it other than your rival, but Route 26 and Route 27 leading up to Victory Road both have a bunch of trainers, some of which are mandatory, but most of them you can skip. But of course, I accidentally run into one of these trainers, and I'm completely unprepared for it. The trainer in question is Ace Trainer Joyce, who has a Pikachu and a Blastoise. Well, I'm leading Monet, so I just spore the Pikachu on turn one, and then I recover as it snoozes for two turns. From here, I use Smokescreen a bunch to lower Pikachu's accuracy, while also sporing it again to put it back to sleep. Then I decide to transform to steal her Pikachu's powers, and quick attack a few times to knock it out. Then Blastoise comes out. I thought I was clever by transforming into Pikachu to prepare for the Blastoise in the back, but then I remember that it's, it's a freaking Pikachu, and this thing is just gonna wreck me with Surf. I go for a Thunderbolt, which does very little damage, and then Blastoise sets up Rain Dance, so now Surf is definitely gonna kill us. I go for a Thunder Wave to paralyze Blastoise, and then he hits a Surf, which crits. So yeah, Monet goes down hard. Thunder Wave was also kind of incredibly stupid, because now that Blastoise is paralyzed, I can't put it to sleep. I'm kind of a panicky idiot when I'm caught off guard like this. Well, I bring in Wood, who has Mega Drain, fully expecting Blastoise to kill us with another Surf. Mega Drain does very little damage, and then Blastoise gets fully paralyzed. So I go for another Mega Drain, and then Blastoise gets fully paralyzed again. Well, that was stupid lucky. I mean, sorry for that, Monet, rest in peace. But lesson learned, I definitely need to be more careful. Okay, oh sh- So Ace Trainer Megan has Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, and Venusaur. I'm leading with Angusola, who knows Aerial Ace, which obviously doesn't kill Bulbasaur in one shot, but it just retaliates with a weak takedown, so another Aerial Ace finishes it off. Ivysaur is second, and we hit it with another Aerial Ace, but a Petal Dance does good damage in retaliation. I decide to switch to Van Gogh, who tanks another Petal Dance, and then I spore the Ivysaur. Funny enough, even though it's asleep, Ivysaur still gets confused by Petal Dance. I use Synthesis to get back to full HP, but Ivysaur wakes up and hits through Confusion to connect with the Petal Dance. So I put it back to sleep and then Synthesis again. This time Ivysaur stays asleep. So I finish it off with a Rock Tomb. Last is Venusaur. I spore the Venusaur, and then I switch to Keen, who starts using Smokescreen. But Venusaur wakes up and manages to connect with the Sleep Powder. So I switch to Van Gogh, who gets hit by a Leech Seed. So I spore Venusaur, and then I switch to Wood as Venusaur stays asleep so I get off Smokescreen two more times. But I might as well not have, because Venusaur wakes up and hits another Leech Seed. I switch to Bob Ross, and Venusaur finally misses a move, so I'm able to hit it with Spore. Then I switch to Wood. And then I hit an Aerial Ace as Venusaur stays asleep. I switch back to Bob Ross, who avoids a Leech Seed as Venusaur wakes up. Then I Spore it back to sleep. And then I switch to Van Gogh. But Venusaur wakes up, connects with a Petal Dance, and gets a critical hit. That's now two of the Kanto starters that have crit killed one of my Smeargles. Well, I bring in Wood and just start aerial acing. Of course, Venusaur connects again. Thanks for nothing, Smokescreen. But it wasn't a crit, so Wood manages to survive. This lets me finally knock out the Venusaur, ending an excruciating and completely avoidable battle. Rest well, Van Gogh. Sorry about that. Alright, well, it's time to face the last fight before the Elite Four. We're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Fascism for the last time. He starts with his Sneasel, so we lead with Bob Ross, who is able to outspeed and knock it out with a double kick. Nice crit, buddy. Next is Golbat, which is perfect. We spore it to sleep, and then we switch to Keen. Then I go for Smokescreen for a few turns. Golbat is able to outspeed, so we risk flinches with Bite, which does actually happen pretty consistently, including a crit flinch on one turn, but eventually we're able to get Golbat all the way down to minus 6 accuracy. So I switch to Bob Ross, and then instantly put the sucker to sleep. 
Then I switch to Ivazovsky, who starts setting up with swords dances. Ivazovsky has own tempo, so Golbat can't confuse it. After three swords dances, a rock tomb knocks out Golbat. Next is Magneton, who goes down to a dig. Then it's Typhlosion, who also goes down to a dig. And then it's Kadabra, who also goes down to a dig, despite setting up Reflect. Last is Haunter, who can't actually hit us. So even though Rock Tomb doesn't kill- oh, never mind, we get a critical hit. Nice! It's about time we had a fight go exactly according to plan. Well, with that, we've made it to the Pokémon League. So it's time to prepare. This is by far the hardest part of the challenge. Up until now, I've been able to strategically choose which six Smeargles I bring into each fight to completely optimize the team for each individual battle. However, against the Pokémon League, I need to optimize their movesets for five battles at the same time. That's 24 moves to deal with 26 Pokémon. There's very little room for error here. On top of that, almost every single Pokémon in the Pokémon League will one-shot my Smeargles if they get a critical hit. And in many cases, even a non-critical hit will just straight up kill them. I can somewhat alleviate that with investing EVs into HP, Defense, and Special Defense, but that then comes at the expense of Attack and Speed EVs. And Smeargles definitely need the offensive EVs to be able to do any reasonable amount of damage before they get knocked out in return. The solution I come up with is to have three defensive Smeargles for setup, and three offensive Smeargles to deal damage. The defensive Smeargles will set up with moves like Swords Dance, sketched from Farfetch'd on Route 47, and Nasty Plot, which can be sketched from an Ace Trainer at the Lake of Rage who has a Nene Tails. Then the defensive Smeargles will baton pass to the offensive Smeargles, who have a range of super effective attacks that can be used to knock out the opposing Pokémon. Baton Pass can be sketched from a Psychic on Route 27 who has a Girafferidge. Normally when I use Baton Pass strats, which I admit, I do do often, it's to minimize the risk of crits. There are usually other strategies that would work, so sometimes it does feel kinda cheap to rely on Baton Pass, but I genuinely think that this is the only way to do this with Smeargles. They are just so bad. And remember that just a little bit of bad luck in the form of bad sleep turns or unfortunate crits means that we're completely screwed here. But here's the final six Smeargles that will be completing the journey, all leveled up to level 47 to match Karen's Houndoom. If you notice, a lot of them are Smeargles we haven't used much, so I was able to EV train them optimally. Others, like Angisola, aren't exactly optimally EV trained for their specific roles, but they'll have to do. With nine beautiful flames already snuffed out, it's time to see how much more artistic talent this challenge will rob from the world before it's all said and done. Let's see if they've got what it takes. First is Will, and I lead Pollock. I set up a Swords Dance, as Zatu then immediately goes off script and uses U-Turn to bring out Exeggutor. I was hoping Zatu would use Confuse Ray, which Pollock is immune to thanks to own tempo, and then I could lock her in with Encore. This ends up working out though, because Exeggutor just goes for Reflect, so we lock her in with Encore. Then we set up our remaining Swords Dances, and then we Baton Pass to Bob Ross, who now has plus 6 attack. I timed it perfectly so that Reflect wears off. This lets me knock out Exeggutor with a Technician boosted Black Glasses Bite, which crits. The rest of Will's Pokémon also go down to a bite. You'll notice here that I did edge all my Smeargles to near level 48 so that they'd gain levels in battle, which is okay according to my rule set. Another small positive about Smeargles is that they do level up very quickly. Alfclaint also has an EXP share attached here so that she can gain some levels before it's time for her to take on Lance. Anyways, that's Will defeated. Next up is Koga. He leads Ariados, and I lead Angusola. She's been so clutch throughout this playthrough, and I really need her to come through again here. Thankfully, she connects with Will-O-Wisp on the first turn, burning Ariados. We do have a wide lens equipped, but it's still only 82.5% effective in this generation, so that was lucky. Ariados just uses Spiderweb though, so that was a free turn. Then Angusola starts going for nasty plots. Poison Jab doesn't do much thanks to Burn though. We get lucky to avoid crits and poison as we manage to get off all three nasty plots we need to knock out Muck that's waiting in the back. Then it's a baton pass to Wood, who gets poisoned by a poison jab. That really sucks because we still need to set up an agility here to be able to outspeed Koga's Crobat. Koga uses a full restore as Wood uses agility. Since Ariados' burn is healed, I have no choice but to just knock it out with a technician boosted confusion. Muck comes out next, so I just knock it out with another confusion. But Poison is now going to take us out in a few turns as Fortress comes out. Koga's Crobat also has Quick Attack, so when it comes out, it'll just kill us before we can get off an attack. Fortunately, Fortress is pretty weak, as long as it doesn't explode, so I decide to heal here with Recover. And thankfully, Fortress just goes for a Swift, which doesn't crit. I recover again as Fortress just uses Toxic Spikes. So on the next turn, I knock out Fortress with a Flamethrower. 
Next is Crobat, but it doesn't go for Quick Attack and just goes down to a Confusion. And so last is Venomoth, but it too falls to a single Confusion, winning us the battle. That was a fairly lucky fight, but we need to be even luckier against Bruno, who has fighting types. Fortunately, he leads with a Hitmontop, whose only fighting type moves are Counter and Triple Kick. Triple Kick is a move that has the potential to hit three times in a row. The first hit has 10 base power, the second has 20 base power, and the third has 30 base power. For an effectively 60 base power move, which is boosted by Hitmontop's Technician. With Stab and being super effective, that is more than enough to kill Smeargle even without a critical hit. So why is this fortunate? Well, don't quote me on this, but based on my experience, I have a hunch that the AI is dumb about multi-hit moves. I think that the AI reads the potential damage of a multi-hit move as the damage from a single hit. This means that the AI thinks that Triple Kick only has 10 base power, which combined with Technician, Stab, and Super Effective damage results in an effective base power of only 45, instead of <laughs> 270 if it were to hit all three times. This means that Dig, with 80 base power, will always be the better move in the eyes of the AI. So, my hunch is that Hitmontop will never go for Triple Kick here. And that means we can semi-safely get away with setting up another sweep. Let's see if I'm right. I start by having Angusola hit another clutch Will-O-Wisp. And then Hitmontop does indeed go for Dig. That's huge. I start setting up with Nasty Plot as Dig hits for a small bit of damage, though it does crit. Then it's just a few more turns of using Recover to stay healthy, and Nasty Plot to get to plus 4 as Hitmontop goes for counter. Then I Baton Pass to Wood as Hitmontop uses Dig. I miss my first attack because of Dig, which does just a bit of damage. Then Technician Boosted Confusion knocks out the rest of Bruno's team. We have a Choice Vex on Wood, which is just enough to finish off the Machamp without needing to go to plus 6. Bruno's Onyx doesn't take super effective damage from Confusion, but it's an Onyx, so it goes down. Hitmonchan is a little scary since it has Bullet Punch, but at this HP, even a crit would barely miss out on the kill. But it doesn't even go for it. So, that's Bruno defeated. Okay, last for the Elite Four is Karen. She has a lot of shenanigans at her disposal, so I do have to be very careful here. But I do have a plan. She leads Umbreon, and I instantly set up a Swords Dance with Pollock as Umbreon goes for a Double Team. Then I decide to Encore it into Double Team. A little risky, but it's fine. I Swords Dance two more times as Umbreon is stuck in Double Team. I make the mistake of Swords Dancing a fourth time, thinking that it'll be smart to wait for the Encore to run out and then Encore him into Double Team again, but then Twitch chat reminds me that Encore can miss because of the Double Team. So that was super stupid. Thank you, Twitch chat. So I just Baton Pass to Bob Ross as Umbreon thankfully continues to be stuck in the Encore. So two Aerial Aces that never miss finish off the Umbreon. And then Gengar comes out. Viewers, I have no idea what spurred me to double check that I outspeed this Gengar, but thankfully I did, because I do not outspeed this Gengar, which is very, very bad. Because Gengar has Focus Blast, which will absolutely kill Bob Ross. I cannot believe that I forgot to make sure that Bob Ross would outspeed Gengar. It would if he had a better speed IV. But I'm honestly more surprised that I just randomly checked it now, because had I just gone for a bite, I would have been in for a very, very nasty surprise. But nevertheless, this is pretty bad. The good news is that Focus Blast only has 5 PP, and it has 70% accuracy. Gengar also doesn't have any other moves to hit our normal types with. So it can only kill, at most, 5 of our Smeargles. And if I get a little lucky and it misses a few Focus Blasts, then maybe, maybe I don't wipe here. But I absolutely need to switch out here, because if it kills Bob Ross, we just can't beat the rest of Karen's Pokemon. So the first thing to do is switch out to Wood, as Gengar unfortunately connects with her first Focus Blast. But Wood has done his job already and won't be needed for Lance. Thank you for your sacrifice, Wood. Then I bring out Pollock. Now somehow, against all odds, because Pollock has max HP EVs and almost max special defense EVs, Pollock manages to survive a Focus Blast with 5 HP. An absolute legend. This lets him get off a smoke screen, which now lowers the accuracy of Gengar's Focus Blast to just 52.5%. Now it's time to get stupid lucky. I switch to Angusola, and Gengar misses a Focus Blast. Three Focus Blasts down, two more to go. Gengar misses another Focus Blast, as Angusola just goes for Recover to stall a turn. Unfortunately, with Gengar's last Focus Blast, she connects, finally bringing an end to Angusola. Thanks for everything you've done this run, you little pupper. Rest well. That's two deaths to this monstrous Gengar, but it looks like things are going to be okay. 
I bring Pollock back out, and since the AI doesn't like to switch very much, Gengar just tries to go for Spite. This lets me set up a sword stance. Then I go for Encore to trap the Gengar into Spite so that it doesn't click Destiny Bond. This lets me set up another sword stance. And then, after another useless Spite, I baton pass to Bob Ross. Back to where we started. A bite kills Gengar. Then Houndoom comes out, and I kill it with a double kick. Then Murkrow comes out. It has Sucker Punch, which is priority and will kill if it crits, so I spore it on the first turn. Then I kill it with double kick. Last for Karen is Vileplume, which goes down to an Aerial Ace, winning us another incredibly tough battle. With the Elite Four defeated, it's time to take on Lance with our four remaining Smeargles. I have a plan, but it requires a good amount of luck against his Gyarados. I screw up yet again and assume that my Smeargles will outspeed Gyarados, but because my setup Smeargles have zero speed EVs and bad speed IVs, they don't outspeed, meaning I'm also at risk to flinches from Waterfall. This is really scary. I lead with Pollock, who barely tanks a Waterfall, but he doesn't get flinched, so he's able to get off a smoke screen. Ideally, we get another smoke screen off, but that's not happening. An Ice Fang takes him out, bringing our death toll to a dozen Smeargles. Rest well, Pollock. Next up is Peters, who also doesn't outspeed Gyarados. Fortunately, he has maxed out HP and defense EVs, so he takes Waterfall a bit better than Pollock, meaning that a critical hit Waterfall is just barely enough to not kill. Thankfully, we get a Spore off. This lets me recover back to full HP as Gyarados snoozes for two turns. Next, I just start clicking Spore. The idea behind this is to hit Gyarados right as it wakes up to reset the sleep turns, since the number of turns that a Pokemon can sleep is completely random, so it's pretty likely to wake up soon. But I end up wasting two turns that I could have set up with Nasty Plot. Let's hope that didn't just piss away the game. Okay, well on the next turn, Gyarados wakes up and hits a Waterfall as Peters hits another Spore, so I recover on the next turn. And then I go for a Nasty Plot as Gyarados sleeps again. Then Gyarados wakes up, but misses a Waterfall thanks to Pollock's Smokescreen, so we get another Nasty Plot off. We need one more though, so as Gyarados hits another Waterfall, we Spore it to sleep. Then Peters uses Recover, and fortunately Gyarados stays asleep, so we get the last Nasty Plot off. Then I Spore until Gyarados wakes up, which lets us put it back to sleep without it having taken any turns of sleep. So on Gyarados' first turn of sleep, we Baton Pass, bringing out our Ringer against Lance, Alf Cleant but she needs to get off an agility to outspeed Lance's Aerodactyl. If Gyarados wakes up, Waterfall can kill. So, she uses agility, and Gyarados stays asleep. From here, we're able to kill the Gyarados with a Thunderbolt that we sketched from a Raichu in National Park. Then, Lance's strongest Dragonite comes out, but we know Aurora Beam, which we sketched from a Cloyster on Route 34. It's thankfully enough to one-shot this Dragonite, as well as Lance's other two Dragonites that come out next. After that is Charizard, but a plus six magnet boosted Thunderbolt is just barely enough to guarantee a kill on Charizard, making it the only Kanto starter that did not take out a Smeargle. And then last for Lance is his speedy Aerodactyl, who we managed to outspeed and knock out in one shot with another Thunderbolt, winning us the battle and the run. 12 deaths and many, many, many hours later, we finally did it. We got to the Hall of Fame with nothing but a bunch of Smeargles. That was a really wild challenge. Having to craft the movesets based on what was available to be sketched at any point in the game was a lot of fun, and it made for a very unique challenge. I'd highly recommend it, it really makes you think in a way that no other challenge does. But it's also super exhausting because of how many different options there are at any given point. That's why I wasn't quite ready to hop over to Kanto and try to best the remaining 8 gyms and Trainer Red, at least not right now. If you want to see that though, let me know in the comments. And I'm sure I'll return to this game for more Smeargle shenanigans at some point. Until then, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't, I, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. Oh, and Happy New Year! 2021 was wild for this channel, and I'm really excited for what's coming in 2022. To stay up to date on everything, be sure to join the Flag on HG community Discord where you can also discuss nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link is in the description. Stay tuned for more nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.